Okay, welcome back uh, after the break. Uh, we're looking at uh, chapter 8, where we're looking at uh, Jesus as the sinless lamb. And uh, to understand how he is the sinless lamb, uh, we are looking at some of the Old Testament sacrifices uh, that talk to us uh, or show us how Jesus was the sinless lamb because the Old Testament has a lot of um, uh, details about sacrifices that the God had ordained for the people of Israel. And by looking and studying these sacrifices, we will understand how Jesus became the sinless lamb who took on the sins of the whole world and made the full sufficient perfect sacrifice. And the first uh, uh, sacrifice that was instituted by God we see here is the Passover uh, sacrifice. And uh, in that we see uh, that, uh, you know, uh, God tells them to uh, make a sacrifice of a lamb that is a male lamb, a year old, without uh, blemish, spot, uh, or uh, any sickness or disease or uh, any physical disability. And hence we see that Jesus is also the, called the Passover lamb because he was uh, a pure, holy, uh, uh, without blemish, which means that he was sinless and he could take on the sins of the whole world, and hence he made the full sufficient and perfect um, sacrifice. Okay? Now we look at a few more uh, sacrifices in the Old Testament, um, and we will um, look at those sacrifices, and we will see how Jesus uh, you know, fulfilled uh, those sacrifices, and hence we don't have to make those sacrifices, and how he fulfilled it, uh, by being uh, the sinless lamb of God. Okay? So the second uh, sacrifice we will look at is uh, the lamb that was sacrificed in the morning and evening uh, sacrifice. We read this in Exodus chapter 29, uh, verses 38 to 42. So I request one of you to read that piece. Um, with 16 of us, and it will be good if more of you could turn in your Bibles and uh, read uh, so that there be a uh, good class participation. Okay. Uh, so can one of you please read Exodus chapter 29, verse 38 to 42. Exodus chapter 29 verses 38 to 42. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lamps of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamp you shall offer in the morning and the other you shall offer at twilight. With the one lamp you shall be one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of pressed oil and one-fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and you shall offer it the grain offering and the drink offering as in the morning, for a sweet aroma, an offering made by the fire of the door, fire of the Lord. This shall be continually burnt offering throughout your generation at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with you. Thank you. So here we see uh, the... Uh the you know, details that God gives, uh, the description for the morning and evening sacrifice. So there had to be a morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice that had to be done daily and had to be continued throughout uh, the generations. Okay, uh, So in both the morning and evening sacrifices, daily was offered a lamb that was a burnt offering. Uh, and this, uh, this lamb was sacrificed completely. It was burned at the altar. In addition to the sacrifice of the lamb, we see that uh, this morning and evening a sacrifice also consists of a grain and a drink offering, which is known as a meal offering, M-E-A-L. It's also called a meal offering. Uh, and these, this meal offering, which comprised of grain and drink offering, uh, did not contain uh, or the products that did not contain any blood. Okay? So, the primary importance of this burnt offering 
was that it could atone for the sins of the Israelites. Okay, so that God could, when the sins were atoned, you know, God would come, would, could come, uh, and who God who is holy, who is pure, uh, who cannot stand sin, uh, would come, could come and relate to the people of Israel, would come in their midst. And we understand that, you know, we are sinful, we are born in sin, uh, the law of sin reigns in our uh, uh, mortal bodies, and hence we can't relate to God. And uh, these sacrifices, both the morning and evening, kind of atoned, which means kind of covered our sins. And note that it was just something that covered their sins, but could not take away their sins totally. And hence, uh, both the morning and the evening sacrifices had to be made. It had to be made daily and God said through the uh, generations. Okay. Uh, so we see that uh, the animal sacrifice, the lamb that was made as a burnt offering was basically to cover for the sins. Uh, so the death that animal uh, took our place, took the, uh, represented the, the, uh, the Israelite race. Okay, it, was, uh, it took their place and it uh, took upon itself their sins and died in their place. The penalty for sin is death. Uh, uh, and the burnt offering also speaks of a complete consecration because the entire animal being, uh, had to be sacrificed and was consumed by fire. Uh, it basically resembles, um, you know, that there had to be complete consecration uh, of the people of God uh, so that God could relate to them, God could speak to them. So basically the entire sacrifice or the entire lamb being sacrificed, the entire lamb being consumed by fire is basically uh, the teaching or spoke of complete consecration. Now the meal offering uh, basically consisted of the first fruits that people uh, gave, the first produce of uh, their labor. Uh, therefore the meal offering uh, resembles or uh, spoke of uh, consecrating one's whole life and substance to God. Everything that they owned, you know, their very life and everything that they have, the blessing of the work of their hands, everything was consecrated to uh, God. So this is the meaning of this morning and evening sacrifice. The burnt offering uh, spoke of complete consecration uh, because the entire sacrifice was consumed by fire and the meal offering uh, that was uh, uh, the, uh, the, the first fruits uh, of the produce of their land or their labor uh, basically spoke of consecrating one's life, uh, 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 giving their everything, their all, everything that they had belonged to uh, God. So the daily sacrifice, the morning and evening daily sacrifice spoke of daily uh, atoning for the sins of for the people and also it spoke of daily consecration, daily consecrating themselves, submitting themselves uh, in obedience, in alignment to the will, to the plan, and the purpose, and keeping of his laws and uh, commandments. Now we see that Jesus, who is the sinless Lamb of God, uh, did not need to offer up daily sacrifices. Okay, why didn't he have to offer up uh, daily sacrifices as being the sinless Lamb of God? Uh, we will look at uh, what Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 and 27 says. Uh, can one of you read Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 and 27, please? For as such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, what does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for their own sin and then for the people's for this he did once for all when he offered up himself thank you Zinatoli. so here we see that uh, you know the high priest here uh, refers to as jesus who is our great in the city a high priest our mediator uh, so we see that uh, you know he was holy he was uh, undefiled uh, he was sinless, he was separate from the entire human race in that, that he was um, uh, sinless. And we see that because he was without blemish or spot or, or, 
uh, and that he was sinless, he did not need to offer up uh, daily sacrifices. It says here in verse 27, he does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for their own sins, then for the people. So we see in the, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the priest on the day of atonement, we already looked at it in the previous chapter, we saw that you know, the priest had to uh, take two lamb or uh, two goats, one uh, uh, lamb that he had to uh, you know sacrifice it and then um, uh, you know he would uh, take it to the holy of holies and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat of the of the uh, you know, ark of the covenant and we see that before he the priest goes into the holy of holies he had to cleanse himself by washing his clothes and uh, he also had to offer a ram as a sacrifice for his own sins before he went into the holy of uh, holies because he himself is sin sinful uh, he himself has committed a lot of sins so he had to atone for his own sins and then atone for the sins of the entire israelite race and the second lamb we saw that you know was a scapegoat uh, in which they placed the priest would place uh, his hands on that boat and they would let it off in the wilderness where it would uh, die Okay, so this was the yearly sacrifice that was done. And we see that Jesus did not have to do this uh, daily sacrifices. Why? Uh, because it says here, uh, you know, and he did not have to offer up uh, a sacrifice for himself because he was sinless. And so he did not have to offer up any sins for his own self. Uh, but, uh, you know, he did it. Uh, he made a full sufficient perfect sacrifice once for all. Okay. And as I mentioned uh, a few minutes earlier, that uh, every sacrifice that was made, even if it was the yearly atonement sacrifice, or it was a Passover piece they celebrated, or was it any sacrifice that they had made personally for their own sins or for their own cleansing, we see that it was just an atonement, it was a covered up for their sins, it just covered their sins, uh, you know, uh, for a temporary period, for a short time. Okay, and that is why they would require the morning and evening sacrifices because you know they would sin throughout the day, so the evening sacrifices they might have sin throughout the evening, the night, so the morning sacrifice. Okay, but when we see that Jesus did not have to make this morning and evening sacrifice because the one sacrifice that he made of his very life on the cross, uh, you know, made was the full sufficient perfect sacrifice that God required once for all for the sins of the entire human race, past, present, and uh, future, and it appeased uh, God, it atoned totally, once for all, forever, the sins of the entire human race, and hence uh, there was no need for Jesus himself to make the body and evening. Um, sacrifice. Okay, so can somebody read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, please? Hebrews 10, 11 and 12. And everything gone. Okay, why don't you continue? Hebrews 10 11 and 12. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for his sin, forever sat down at the right hand of God. Thank you. So here we see that the priests, even though they offer the morning and evening sacrifice daily, they could never take away the sins or atone for the sins of uh, the, uh, of mankind. But we see this man, and the capital M there refers to Jesus Christ, that he offered up for one sacrifice for sins forever and sat down at the right hand of God. That means uh, he made a full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice. Okay, and why did uh, he not have to make daily sacrifices? Is because uh, Jesus was holy, like we read, he was harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. 
but also we see that you know uh, Jesus was one with the Father. Okay, uh, we looked at in the earlier chapters that he was in the bosom of the Father, which means talks about his perfect oneness, his intimacy, his unity uh, uh, in his relationship with the Father. And we see that uh, he was Jesus was fully surrendered, and his life was totally consecrated, uh, and he was sinless lamb. Uh, and hence, uh, by offering up of himself as a sacrifice, he brought an end to the daily sacrifice. Why? Because that um, he was a uh, he was a sinless uh, lamb, and also his life was totally and fully consecrated. Remember, I said that uh, the daily offerings, the morning and evening sacrifices, uh, it spoke of or resembled. Um, you know, the atonement for the sins and also of uh, uh, consecration of one's whole life and everything that they had. Yes, Paul, you have your you have a question? Yeah, Paul, you put up your hand. Okay, uh, any questions, anyone has? So we saw how Jesus is the Passover lamb and uh, how, you know, uh, because he made the full sufficient perfect sacrifice, he did not have to make the morning and evening sacrifices uh, daily uh, for the generations to come as God had instituted uh, in the sacrificial system for the Israelites. Then we will look at Jesus as the suffering lamb. Uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 to 10. Can one of you read that, please? Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7 to 10. And uh, someone else can open up to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 7 to 10. He was oppressed. He was affiliated. He was opened. He opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to be to the slaughter, as a sheep before his sharer in is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was striken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was put him to grief. When you make, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed he shall prolong his day and the pleasure of the lord shall prosper in his hand thank you can you, uh, someone else can read first peter chapter 2 verse 21 to 24. you don't have your bibles open you want me to pull it up on the screen first peter chapter 2 verse 21 to 24. for to this you are called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his step, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in it. He was revived, did not revive in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, him, but committed himself to him who judged righteously who himself bore our sin in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose strife you were healed. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so here we see that scripture talks about uh, you know, the suffering lamb, and who is referred to in, uh, who is spoken about in Isaiah chapter 53. Who is the he mentioned here? He was oppressed, he was afflicted, 
He opened not his mouth, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. So who is the he mentioned in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7 to 10? I'm Jesus. Yes, thank you, Jesus. And so we see that Jesus was like uh, the lamb, okay, led to the slaughter, uh, taking on the sins of the entire human uh, race, okay. Um, so we see that scripture talks about Christ as a suffering lamb and it mentions that he was oppressed, he was uh, afflicted, uh, when he was reviled, that means when he was criticized, when he was, uh, uh, when they said uh, very unpleasant things and strongly, uh, strong words and uh, and said unpleasant things towards him, he did not retaliate in return. He did not criticize them in return. He did not say unpleasant things in return. And it also describes how Christ uh, willingly and passively bore the penalty for our uh, sins. We see that he was stricken, that means he was beaten, he was bruised uh, for the sins of the people and uh, it was the will of God. <coughs> sorry, it was the will of God that Jesus be uh, bruised. Okay. Uh, if you note the purpose of his suffering here was uh, you make his soul an offering for um, sin, which is uh, mentioned here in. Uh, yeah, you make his uh, in verse ten of Isaiah chapter fifty-three. It says, "Yet it pleased the Lord." To bruise him, and he was, and he was put, and he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for uh, sin, okay. So the word offering in uh, Hebrew is asham, which means a trespass offering. That means a sin offering, okay, or a guilt offering. The word trespass means uh, here means guilt. And it denotes being guilty or uh, of violating the rights of others, uh, whether it is God or man. So we see that Christ became uh, as a suffering lamb of God so that he would make his life as an offering uh, for the sins, uh, as a trespass offering, as a guilt um, offering. And we read about this uh, trespass offering or this guilt offering in Leviticus chapter 5 uh, to uh, the whole of chapter 5 verses uh, uh, 14 onwards to chapter 6 verse 7. We also read about it in Numbers chapter 5 verse 7 and 8. And in this specific uh, trespass offering which is called also as the guilt offering, uh, we see that the person uh, who has violated a right or who has uh, uh, infringed on the rights of others and violated the rights of others, or whether it is God or man, they had to make a sacrifice to God. So they had to come to the temple, they had to make a sacrifice to God, and they also had to pay back the person whom, uh, whose rights they had infringed upon or violated. Uh, they had to give back exactly what um, the losses that has occurred and apart from that they had to uh, you know make a payment of one fifth of uh, the, the total uh, you know loss that was occurred so they had to make a sacrifice to God and it was not just a restitution uh, or a sacrifice to atone for their sins or cover up for their sins with God but they had to go back to the person that they had sinned against and they had to give back exactly what they have taken. And they also had to pay back one-fifth of the total expenditure or the loss that had occurred. So basically, they're paying back 120% of what, um, you know, the rights they had infringed or violated of from um, uh, others. So we find that, um, you know, uh, Jesus Christ became the suffering lamb uh, so that his life could be an offering for the uh, uh, you know, as a uh, uh, for the guilt that uh, the guilt offering, or you know, the 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 the, uh, the laws that we have violated, the way we have violated the laws uh, of God, the way that we have violated His commandments, the way that we have gone against Him in doing things, and also the way that we have infringed or violated uh, others' uh, rights as well. So Jesus Christ became that trespass offering or that uh, guilt offering, okay? Um, so we see that uh, the trespass offering not only uh, 
you know, involving atonement uh, for the sin, but also social restitution for the wrong that had been uh, made. Okay. So Christ became our trespass offering, and how did he became our uh, the guilt offering in our place? Uh, he made restitution for us by paying for uh, the, the debts for our sins uh, to a white holy God uh, to whom we have you know uh, violated all of his commands, his laws, his standards, uh, and his holiness. And so we, we see that Christ Jesus provided the required compensation that needed uh, to satisfy God so that we can be reconciled back to God. Okay? So through this trespass offering that Jesus made, or through this guilt offering that Jesus made, uh, we see that he made, uh, uh, he gave his very life, okay? uh, so he made restitution for us by paying for uh, the debt for our sin uh, to a holy God, uh, who had been violated, and through this uh, compensation that was required by God uh, to satisfy not only uh, the sins of mankind, but also to restore back the relationship, to reconcile man back to God. And hence, Jesus, the sinless Lamb of God, made that perfect sacrifice that was required for the compensation uh, needed by God to satisfy this holy God whom we had stand guilty before and whom uh, we had uh, violated. Okay? If you look at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 11 and 12, can one of you read that please? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 11 and 12. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 11 and 12. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, so far outside the gate. Amen. Thank you. So we see that uh, in, this, uh, in this verses, we read that the Christ support outside the outside the city. He was suffered, he was crucified on the cross outside the city uh, and that is related to the bodies of those animals that were born outside the sanctuary. We see that, you know, in the Old Testament sacrifices, if you read, the animal was sacrificed, the blood was, you know, um, spilled on the altar, was sprinkled on the altar. Uh, once in a year, it was uh, sprinkled on uh, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. But uh, we see that, you know, the skin of the animals, the offals or the, you know, the other intestines and everything was burned outside the city. Uh, uh, and it, it, sometimes even the animal was even burned outside the city, uh, not just the leftover parts, but also some parts of the animal was burned. Why? Because once the animal was, uh, the sins was placed upon the animal, the animal was uh, sinful, uh, it was unholy, it was uh, now without blemish or uh, uh, it, was, it was stained and hence it was considered as unholy and so it was burned outside the city uh, because it was unholy. And so we see that uh, Jesus, the sinless Lamb of God, was holy but for our sakes he took on our sins, he became uh, a sinner in our place and uh, Hence, you know, uh, he, since he took on the sins of the whole world, mankind, the sins of the whole mankind was placed on him just like the lamb that was without blemish. When the sins of the uh, Israelite race was put on that, the lamb became, uh, you know, uh, sin, sinful and it was born outside the city gates. And hence we see that Jesus himself uh, was spotless without any sin, he was holy. Uh, but when he took on the sins of the entire human race, he was sacrificed, he was seen as uh, someone detestable uh, in the eyes of the Jews, the, the high priests, the Jewish leaders. They did not like him, they hated him. Uh, and we see that, uh, you know, also in the other sense that he was detestable because he now became unholy, he was uh, 
who carried on the sins of the whole world and like that scapegoat who was let off sorry, into the wilderness, he uh, uh, took on the sins of the whole world and died in our place and hence uh, he took our place uh, of, um, you know, in our sins and became uh, someone totally uh, detestable. Okay, so we see that he suffered outside the gate uh, just like the animals that were sinful now were born outside the uh, sanctuary. Okay, so in studying Christ as a sinless lamb, we see how the sacrifices in the Old Testament uh, very clearly uh, spoke and uh, specifically uh, it spoke about various aspects of Christ as the uh, Lamb of God, and so we see the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament were uh, kind of pointers or spoke about um, uh, the sinless Lamb of God that could, could come and would make the full sufficient perfect um, sacrifice. Okay, uh, so it's important for us to know that throughout the Old Testament, God was actually foreshadowing uh, the coming of Christ. So Christ, uh, the sacrifices were the foreshadow or a, a type of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, what was going to happen in the future with Christ coming and him making the uh, sacrifice. So it was in the Old Testament, God was foreshadowing the coming of Christ in many different ways. Uh, and one of them was through the institution of uh, uh, the sacrifices that were made uh, in the temple uh, both the morning and evening sacrifice, the Passover sacrifice, the, the sacrifice of the Day of Atonement, um, and also the sacrifice for the priests who made it for him, uh, selves, and for those who came individually for their trespass offering, also and for as their sin offering. So we see that Jesus, uh, you know, uh, uh, God used all of these sacrifices as a foreshadow of what was coming or what Christ would fulfill in his work when he came to the earth and when he died on the cross. Okay. So any questions thus far? I hope you're able to hear me clearly. And understand clearly. Is my audio clear or still unclear? Ma'am, your audio is clear. We are understanding everything. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Yes, Abu Bakr. Voice is clear, ma. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else has any uh, any questions so far? I hope the rest of you are in uh, you know if, uh, logged in, but I hope you're in class listening because I hardly hear any of, of the voices. Uh, you no know, questions as well. It'd be good to make the class more interactive and engaging rather than just hearing my voice, which kind of becomes kind of boring with the two hour class. Listening to the same person's voice, uh, and I also would like to listen to some of your voices, some of your questions or doubts. Okay, before we end class, uh, if there are no questions, so uh, we can look at uh, the lamb that is mentioned in Revelation. Okay, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, Revelation chapter 14 and 17. Um, now we're going to look at the Lamb of God uh, in the book of Revelation. And of course, this is kind of a little deviating from, uh, you know, our whole, um, the whole lesson plan or the curriculum because we're talking about uh, Christ, his personal work in regard to his incarnation. And so we saw the sinless Lamb of God in regard to his incarnation as well. But here when we're looking at, uh, 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 you know, uh, Jesus as the Lamb of God in the book of uh, Revelation, uh, it's not dealing with the subject of Christ as the incarnate Son of God. Um, because here we see that he's already, uh, you know, ascended back into heaven, seated at the right hand of God. Uh, but just for us to have a better understanding of uh, Christ as the Lamb of God, uh, we will look at uh, his work also as the Lamb of God that's mentioned in Revelation. Okay? The, 29, sorry, the 28 uh, references of Jesus as the Lamb of God uh, in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're just going to look at a couple of them here in, uh, in these chapters. Okay. Um, 
So it would be good for us to read it. Um, for those of us who are struggling to find um, the references, I'll just put this up on the screen so that I can read. Okay, can one of you read Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 to 13, please? It's on the screen there. Revelation 5, 11 to 13. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and, as, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the land forever and ever. Thank you, Sigatori. Uh, someone else can read uh, Revelation 6, 15, and 17. It's on the screen. Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 and 17. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountain, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, who is able to stand. Thank you. So we can know Revelation chapter 14, verses 1, 9, and 10. It's also on your screen. Can one of you read that, please? Revelation chapter 14, verses 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 100, 140,000, and 40,000, having his father's name written on their forehead. 9. Then a third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indication. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Thank you. Uh, so the last uh, scripture passage is Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 to 14. Can one of you read that, please? Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 to 14. Revelation 17, 12 to 14. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdoms as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. This will make war with them, and the land will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Thank you, uh, both of you, Zulatoli and Sakim, for reading those uh, scripture passages. So here we uh, see that uh, the apocalyptic uh, view of the Lamb, when it, uh, what's the meaning of the word apocalyptic? Uh, 
Apocalyptic basically means uh, describing or prophesying the complete destruction of the world. Okay. So when we look at uh, Jesus as the apocalyptic view of the Lamb, or we look at the apocalyptic view of the Lamb, uh, we see that Jesus here in this passage is no longer pictured as someone who is submissive, uh, passive, uh, and uh, as somebody who is uh, you know, there to suffer for uh, the sins of the world, or he's not seen or pictured as a passive, submissive, and suffering uh, sacrifice. Okay. Instead, uh, you know, it's recognized he is or seen as one who was, uh, uh, you know, as a triumphant, victorious, and uh, an overcoming conqueror. Okay. In the as the apocalyptic view of the Lamb, we see uh, Jesus presented, or we see his picture as one who is triumphant, who is victorious, and uh, who is the overcoming conqueror. Uh, not as somebody who is the passive, submissive, and suffering uh, sacrifice, um, not as, uh, and we also recognize him as the one who was uh, slain. Okay, so it's interesting to note uh, that the figure of the lamb is used in uh, Jewish apocalyptic uh, literature. Basically, uh, you know, we see this in the books of uh, uh, prophetical books of Joel and Zechariah. Uh, and a few passages in Isaiah from chapters 24 to 27 and uh, chapter 33. Uh, we also look at it in the book of Daniel uh, and other uh, apocalyptic, uh, Jewish apocalyptic literature like uh, the secrets of Enoch and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the apocalypse of uh, Ezra and John and Baruch. Okay, so all of these uh, are not part of the, um, you know, uh, of course, uh, Joel and Zechariah and Daniel are there in uh, the Bible, but the other non-canonical books are not included in the Bible, but they have certain uh, apocalyptic uh, uh, literature uh, and also talk about, um, you know, uh, they view Jesus as the Lamb of God in the apocalyptic way, okay? So we see that, um, you know, uh, He's uh, seen uh, in the Jewish apocalyptic literature, Jesus is seen as someone uh, or the one who is going to uh, bring about a change. We see that he's, someone, he's looked as someone who overcomes evil and de delivers the people of uh, God. Okay, So this is what is seen or pictured by the Jewish apocalyptic uh, writers. And it is in this same context that the Lamb of Revelation or the Lamb of God in Revelation is viewed. Okay, uh, it's also interesting to note that the Greek term used for Lamb uh, here in uh, the Book of uh, Revelation is not the same that is used in John chapter one verse twenty nine, which we looked at in the beginning of this class, where Jesus says, uh, uh, "See the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world." Okay, so the lamb in Revelation is seen as the one who has conquered everything, who is victorious, triumphant. Uh, the lamb who is the king of kings and the lord of lords, as against what we read in Isaiah, where he is the, the suffering lamb of God, he was reviled, but he did not, uh, uh, you know, criticize back. He, he suffered quietly, passively, and uh, he was that uh, sacrifice that was made. But when we look at him in apocalyptic uh, Jewish literature, and we look at it, uh, look at him in um, uh, in the Book of Revelation, we see him as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, somebody who is being triumphant, uh, victorious, and who has conquered everything. Okay. So that's just mentioning who Jesus presently is now, and he will come back as uh, the triumphant King. Uh, the King of Kings as the Lord of Lords. And right now, also, we see before the throne of God, we see the Lamb that was slain, which is uh, reminding God the Father, not that he needs to be reminded of, but just a reminder for us that, you know, uh, it's uh, we are not receiving the wrath of God like the Old Testament people who suffered uh, immediately for the sins that they have done. It's because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross and we are in that grace period. But there will come a time 
in the tribulation period and after that when you know uh, there would be no longer this grace period when no longer the sacrifice would be there but Jesus himself will be the judge and he will judge uh, us for our sins and that time there's only the judgment that we receive okay heaven or hell okay so that is the end of this chapter anyone has any questions Oops. Yeah, I will. I will. I will tell you about the test, uh, the first assessment uh, in a in a little bit. Uh, if you don't have any questions, then I will. I'll just tell you about the test. No questions for today's class. Chapter eight and chapter nine. Okay, um, then if you don't have any questions, I'll just tell you about uh, the first assessment that is uh, today. Uh, I'll release the paper along with uh, the e-learning for the e-learning portal. Uh, that will be around five o'clock. Um, and since some of you requested three days, uh, I'll give you time to Thursday evening, uh, five o'clock. So by Thursday evening, five o'clock, uh, I would request all of you to uh, uh, send in your papers or, uh, you know, to post back your papers. And uh, uh, the first question is, um, you know, it's a long question. It will have at least two or three paragraphs. Um, please don't copy exactly from the notes or don't copy from any other website or uh, uh, from anyone else. Because even though I, I uh, check the answers of more than 50 people, I can uh, know who's copy from whom it's happened in the past so kindly don't do that don't take it out right from the website or from the notes uh, which is basically like to understand uh, or know what you have understood uh, from uh, what we have uh, studied uh, so that is question one question two and question three is basically a one-liner or maximum two-liner answers and then you will have i think three uh, questions which is multiple checks so for the multiple choice, please read uh, carefully and then you can take the right answers. Okay. Uh, those of you who would like to submit it in today, you can do so. Tomorrow you can do so. Um, it's uh, it's an open book, um, which means you don't have to, uh, you know, you can just go and uh, uh, kind of find where these answers are and then you can just write the answers. But uh, uh, I would request all of you to please uh, you know, this is theology, it's very important uh, for our basis, for our understanding, and also for us to teach others the right doctrine. And that was Paul's main concern. If you look at Paul's, all of his writings, uh, it was basically because of the false doctrines and false teaching that was there. So there is a lot of that, and people do not understand, they have not known the full depth of uh, the revelation of God through his incarnation, through the person and work of Christ. So please read so that you can preach this, you can teach this, and uh, it's important for you to know. So please take time. I know we all run busy schedules, but uh, as it's so important for me to prepare as well and come and teach, it's also important for all of your students to read, even though it's not an exam where we all sit and, uh, you know, there's an invigilator. Uh, but I request you to be honest enough to, uh, you know, Read through and then try to answer without even looking at your notes. That would be good. Okay. Okay. That's about the test. Any questions? Yes. If you don't understand any question, if you need, uh, you need clarity about your answers after you've written it, you can still feel free to ask and I will explain. Okay. If there are no questions for today's class and regarding the test, we'll end class here. Okay, thank you all for joining class and I um, all the best for your test and see you for our next class soon. Bye, have a good day everyone. Thank you.